Yes, now. Thank you so much. It's, uh, I'm very happy to be here, meeting some people that I only knew from reading the papers, seeing old faces. And as Roberta said, I'm, I'm in the IPK, this Institute of Plant Genetics. And it's in, I, I always like to say this, I'll go notice that it's placed in Gata's Lebanon. It's a really small village, but it holds the biggest gene, gene bank in Europe. So we have lots of sequencing data there, and that's when I got in touch with the uh, chromosomes. And what I want to study as a computational biophysicist is how chromosomes compact from interface to, to metaphase. And I take these holocentric chromosomes, I was introduced to them that for, from by Professor Andreas Huben, a chromosome uh, person. And and because they are not very common, so the, the most common type is the monocentric type. But I think these kind of exceptional cases helps us understand how the general rules work, because they kind of don't follow the rules. Uh, so what are the, the holocentric chromosomes? So the monocentric type is the one that we know the most, that they form this X shape. But holocentric chromosomes are different. They do form the X shape of a constriction by at the centromere. So this would be the centromere with the constriction. This is by the time that the microtubes pull them apart. But holocentric chromosomes have centromeres all over the side, and they are pulled parallelly to each other, so they separate in a different ways. So when we see them separating in anaphase, this is where it's easier to recognize them, and in metaphase as well. Um, but it's very, they, there are not many species that are holocentric, but it's very advantage because if some uh, breaks happen in, in the chromosome's normal purpose, when they are bound to the microtubules, they can still go to the right uh, uh, daughter cell. So it's for them okay, they just separate in different chromosomes and that's how they more or less evolve. How these breaks happen, then it's another story. But it's an advantage. So when they separate, and we'll go together, and this, the genetic material is separated in, in, in a nice way. And this, um, this evolution to the holocentric type happened many times during the, the evolution. And we see them in different species, from arthropods like uh, scorpion, we see butterflies, we see many plants. And they evolved independently. So it seems that once happened, it's very advantageous they stood that way. Um, but yeah, but it happens somehow, in, and we don't know how. <laughs> but uh, it's independently and seems to be uh, nice for evolution. Okay, well, the centromeres are actually made of very many centromeric units. That here they are clustered in, in the center, and here they are spread all over the side. And these centromeric units are actually what we call the, the centromeric nucleosomes. They are made of the histomes, and one of them is CNA3, so it's a tree of centromeres. And this would be like the kinetochord that they bound, and then after, uh, after the microtube. And what is very interesting about these holocentric chromosomes, apart from them being in, the, in this line, like in metaphase, they, also, they are also different during interface. So an interface of monocentric type, and here I have barley as an example. We have the, the centromeres of each, of each chromosome clustered already and separated. And then to, towards metaphase, they only get more uh, condensed or more compact. And in the holocentric type, they are spread all over the nucleus. And it was always the question how to bring all these uh, spread centromeric units to a line like in metaphase. And that's where I thought maybe compaction by loop extrusion could help. And I'm so glad that you heard the, the talk by Vittorio because he already explained the loop extrusion and the advantages of it. So I tried to apply this to a model of compaction of chromosomes. Um, and the way I did this was before doing the, the simulation of, cro of, of chromatin, just a 1D simulation bringing different contexts together so it's a pairwise uh, system that we first bring, for example, from a, a nucleosome one and two, and then in the next step we bring we bring uh, from nucleosome zero and three together, and then it will go like this, forming this loop. 
And the idea is that if we do have many of these, well, sorry, I'll come back. Uh, as Vitoria said, these loop extruders, they could be, they are, uh, they, well, now we know that uh, the proteins that do this loop extrusion are part of these SMC proteins, and condensins, cohesins are examples of that. Um, so the idea is that they already work in an interface and they can bring different regions together, different loci together, and then form threads, for example, or different loops. But then when you put lots of them, then we have this compacted state because one of the rules of this extrusion is that when they meet each other, they stop. So they uh, end up bringing these loops side by side. And so, okay, so I, I knew that this loop extrusion was important for compacting the chromosomes, and I had just a very simple idea, and this is a hypothesis-driven um, model, that I thought, well, maybe centromeric units can act as anchors for the loop extruders, so that in a way that when they are extruding a loop and they find a centromeric unit, they stop there and hold there. So this was the simple idea, and I wanted them to simulate this hypothesis-driven idea. And the, the way that I wanted to simulate is also uh, very simple. It's just uh, a quasi-gray model where each nucleosome is one bit, and they have this harmonic uh, spring between them. They can bend, and they also have this uh, excluded volume. But I, I applied this potential with uh, truncation so that they can occasionally cross each other, mimicking the, the function of top isomerase, race. And then there is uh, implicit solvent. I apologize that I don't have any equations here. I'm used to presenting this to plant people, so but I hope you don't mind. Uh, well, and the idea was just that some of these nucleosomes will be centromeric, and then they would act as anchors for, for the loop extruders. Just randomly chosen uh, according to uh, an example of holocentric species that was C. elegans. And my entire, my entire chromosome model, it's only 20 megabase chromosome, more or less, because I simulate 700, 100,000 nucleosomes, and I put there 1,000 centromeric nucleosomes randomly. Uh, so this is a movie, I hope it works, but I'm gonna tell you what it's going to happen here. This is the starting conformation where I let it uh, equilibrate into a uh, spherical confinement. And we can see the, the centromeric nucleosome spread all over, like in, in an interface that we had. And uh, I think here you would see also as yellow beads the, the, the loop extruders shown next the yellow beads. And you can see that it's, it's a very dynamic model. So the, the loop extruders are constantly uh, extruding loops or maybe this milking, and they uh, slowly bring the centromeric unit to a line. So here you can see that, well, this making faster the movie. So we here we can see that the line, uh, the approximating, and here you can see that the, this forms the shape that it still forms a, a linear compaction. And this kind of shape that it's compacted by loops is what I like to identify as the chromonema. I have other works about it, but uh, I think it's easier to understand how this structure uh, would work and its physical properties if we recognize it by a name for it. Okay, uh, so this would be the like a prophase-like compaction of holocentric chromosomes. Well, and sorry, coming back, one uh, one consequence of this model is that we should see around the centromeric nucleosomes the loop extruders. So this is what we try to see in literature and coming back to literature, we really found that uh, centromeric nucleosomes in, in green, they co-localize with clizing a subunity of cohesin, of, of condensing, I guess, or condensing tube. Well, and, and this is what we see. So it's nicely uh, supporting what we see in the experiments and the microscopy. Uh, and then I was presented to another holocentric plant, it's the Cyanographis japonica. And they are uh, a little bit different because they form very big uh, clusters of nucleosomes, 
of oh, so, sorry of clusters of centromers. So we can see in, in interface that they actually have these kind of uh, centrosomes, and they are more dense in these regions, and this is where the centromers are found. And but we have a different numbers of these kind of signals per nucleus, and it's also different than the number of of chromosomes. So we have less than the general example of holocentric plants, but we have more than monocentric uh, cases. So it's a case in between that I wanted to study. And what did this chip check for this, for this plant? And they found out that always when we have a CNA3 si signal, we have also a repeat and heterochromatin signals with it. So it, the central mic units are clustered together with these repeat sequences and the, and the um, uh, heterochromatin. So I thought I should update the model, and what I did was, again, very simple. I just decided that uh, the, the distance, the ideal distance between the centromeric nucleosomes will be a bit smaller than for the other nucleosomes, and this will bring them together, uh, or at least closer, in this interface-like model. So here you see the, the uh, centromeric clusters. They are m denser than the rest, but I'm actually not very happy with this model, and if someone wants to s propose a different potential, I'll be very happy, because it's actually denser than, than the, the experiments. And what they proposed, what they saw in the channel is that they don't have spread nucleosomes or centromers, they actually have a region, and in this region, it's uh, a region of satellite repeats, and in this region, we have the CNA3 nucleosomes. So here I have in blue this region, and, and then the centromeric nucleosomes there. It's about seven, uh, 70, sorry, 60% of nucleosomes in this region are centromeric. And then we can also see that this, these regions, they kind of come close and we can s would see as only one cluster signal. So I was just simulating that, that they can be uh, in closer pro in proximity with the centromeric and then they end up coming together. Um, okay, so when I had the, the model of the central mass, like it's a bit more complicated than the previous one. I again wanted to see how they compact, and it's just applying the loop extrusion model. But the idea here is that we don't have just one nucleosome that will be brought together, but I have an uh, entire cluster of nucleosomes, and when they are kind of in this fight with loop extrusion forces, and these uh, sticky forests that I've, I've named for these centromeric nucleosomes, they kind of stretch and they're again brought into a line. So this is another movie, and we see that the regions of the centromeric nucleosomes, that they are kind of clustered, and they, they are doing the simulation of loop extrusion, you will see that they more or less stretch and form this, again, a line of centromeric nucleosomes, but some regions more than um, some regions denser than the others. I guess I'll just wait a bit for the movie to finish. But I'll, what I like you to to pay attention is that uh, this this chromonema that like I said is not so uniform anymore. Uh, but instead, it, it forms this kind of uh, blobs. And and in the end, we have lots of condensing between these uh, centromeric regions. Yeah, and you can see here that they are kind of stretching and trying to connect to each other. So I guess it's, as I said, it's uh, I, like a game that you have one pulling from one side and the other pulling from the other. So in one side is this sticky force of the centromeric regions, <coughs> and in the other side, is the force of the loop extrusion, trying to bring these clusters together. And you see that it slowly forms this more condensed region, so it's like a, a compact fiber of loops of chromatin. I, I, I think for the next time I would fast forward the movie, but let's, let's just wait it's about to finish. Yes, yeah, so finally you see that again forms the line, even with this potential of sticky force that I'm not very fan of, but 
at least it shows that even with clusters of central mass, you can still form a line and be stretched. And, and it, again, it's a chromonema-like structure, but it this time is a kind of globules around the central mass regions. Uh, so this is the, the what I wanted to show you about the globules. I'm sorry about the different color scale, but this would be the first model that I showed, and we can see that it's very uniform, linear along the along the chromosome, and in this case, it forms these globules, so regions of compaction. And this is actually what, is what we see in the microscopy again. So every time we have a new model and we see, oh, maybe if this model is true, we should see this in the microscopy. And then we come back to the microscope and see that chromosomes of Genographia japonica in, in prophase really show this blob appearance of compaction, and the Rincospora case is a more uniform prophase-like. Okay, and then I ended up with another example of, of holocentric chromosomes, uh, this time in the genus of Rincospera. And I was in collaboration with André and from the Max Planck Institute in Cologne. And he noticed that the, the, this, this genus, they have many examples of holocentric species, and, but they are very different. They have their very different shapes. For example, this one is much bigger than the other, and they have different widths, and they have different distributions of central mass as well. So what, one thing that he measured is that uh, this repeat region, so the size of the central mass unity, was the same, actually, for both of the species. And, and what changed more was this, the size of the, of the spacing between these central mass regions. So what we wanted to try next is simulating again these this holocentric species, but with different distributions of central mark units. And in this genus of Rincosbury, it has a very, uh, well, it's a, uh, it's a big family, I would say. And m my collaborator on there, he sequenced the genome for all of them, and he noticed that they, they are kind of a redistribution of the, the genes of, of the, the sequences of the, this chromosome, so they are uh, recombining in different ways, and they kind of uh, divide into small pieces. So, for example, this one was six, and then there was 12, and then was 24, and it's more or less always the half, and we don't really know why, and that's what we wanted to know, how this uh, whole centric species evolved. A, and if the central mass regions had some part in it. So he measured the central mass length and the spacing between the central mass uh, regions again, and he noticed that the, the central mass region is more or less constant for all the species, except for, for these ones, there he's not really sure that they are really holocentric species. And again, here they appear as points out of place, but in general, they follow this rule that the bigger the chromosome size, the bigger the distance between the central mass regions, and this is what I try to simulate as well. And when and looking at the microscope, we noticed that also for bigger chromosomes, and this makes much sense, but we didn't know how would they compact. So the bigger the chromosome, the, the larger the, the width is that they have in, in metaphase. So this is one example, 300 megabases and a half, and we can see that the width is changing, but, and we thought that maybe, again, this could be explained by the loop extrusion. And when we think about the, the loops in forming this chromonema, like a prophase-like structure, we can see that the loop length really correlates with the width of this compacted structure. So only doing this uh, simulation of 1D of the loop extrusion, we could calculate the mean loop length after equilibration, I say here, but maybe uh, it's better to say steady state. So I, I simulated three different cases of Rugosa, Brevius, Columbia of the same genus Rincospora. And what I did was the same size of, of the, the chromosomes, but they have different centromeric units because d uh, different number of centromeric units because the spacing between them is different. So the idea was just to simulate this, and we could see that they actually have different loop sizes from the 1D simulation. But as Vitoria said, the, the loops, uh, they have like a, a different shape. They, they move in space, and it's not just the stretch uh, chromatin fiber. So 
maybe they have this difference in size, but in, in 3D it wouldn't show. So I try to simulate again. And again, I try to find another way of describing these uh, centromic regions, because in this case we don't see centrosomes, so they shouldn't be more condensed. So I just attach them or force them to be always close to the uh, center of mass for each centromeric uh, region. And this simulation is again what we saw of different centromeric regions, this time with different centrum, with many centromeric nucleosomes per centromeric unit. And again, this, these yellow beads are the loop extruders or these SMC complexes, and they slowly bring these the centromeric regions to align. So even though I change the potential of or the, the way that I describe the centromeric regions, this, this way of compacting seems to be very robust for the holocentric um, type of chromosomes at least. And again, I should fast forward for the next presentation, but let's just wait. We can see it's slowly forming this line. And again, these uh, complexes of loop extruders in between. And you can see, it's, uh, oh, I hope you, s you see the, these yellow beads appearing in different places and then coming out. This is just to say it's a very dynamic process, but it comes to this steady structure of compaction by loops. And again, this kind of chromonema-like structure. And what I did was try to, to measure the, the width of this chromonema structure for these different models that I had, but it's not as simple as looking at the, the microscope and just taking this measurement by eye. So I, I tried to, m to establish like a, a plane that would be perpendicular normal to the line between each centromeric region, and then measure the density of nucleosomes around it. And what I ended up having was something like this. So this would be like the density of nucleosomes around the axis of the, of the, the chromonema for these different models. And uh, the, the place where I have the highest density is different for every model. So I have five nanometers different more or less from each model. And maybe this, we could come back and check in the microscopy if we see these differences. But yeah, just to remember these are prophase like maybe from prophase to metaphase, there are still other steps, and this could be, this, this different would go even higher. And I'm not sure if I should just uh, take this measurement of the peak or somewhere here where we can see that the loops are um, more spread around the, the axis or not. Maybe something to discuss. And then just some take home message that the loop extrusion is a general compaction mechanism for all holocentric species, at least from what we are showing to from these different models. And they are modulated by the distribution of centromeric units, which correlates with the mitotic chromosome shape, and by shape I mean the length and the width that they have, or maybe the chromosome conformation. And then maybe I thought it could be an insightful question, at least for me, is the evolution of holocentric chromosomes affected by their mitotic shape or their mitotic conformation? It's a question because we see the centromeric units with different distributions along the evolution of holocentric species. We don't know how they evolved to these distributions and I thought, well, do the chromosomes conformation affect somehow the way they distribute? And that's it. Well, many thanks for your attention. Again, for I thank you for the opportunity of being here. This will be my main collaborators in this project. And this is my small group that st just started this year. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. So there, there are time for questions, a few questions. Um, uh, e extremely interesting uh, story and um, uh, uh, there was one thing that I, I noticed, but it's, it may be just a bad visual impression. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, your cartoon that you started with showed these two cylinders being pulled apart. And um, the, uh, uh, the pictures that you showed, mostly the, 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 the actual micrographic pictures, showed things being a little bit less than perfect cylinders, but being highly cylindrical. 
I would, I would have said. And then your simulation still shows it as a very crumpled uh, chromonema. Is that just an impression I have that there's still some extra phase transition or something that's straightening these things out, or is it just a quantitative question? Yeah, they, they look more like a worm than a, a, a cylinder, you mean? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, th I think this will be the, the next step. So I think this compaction um, mechanism is only good through until prophase. And from prophase until metaphase for whole century chromosomes, what we propose I hope you also noticed from the, the, the drawing of the cylinders that the centromeres are actually to the side, and in my model, they end up in the, in the axis, the central axis. So what we try to see is if the, the attachment of the kinetal cores will have some effect in this, will have some role. So what I try to simulate next is that I really put them in a line. So I think maybe in the next step of compaction, they are bound to, they are, bound to the kinetal core complex, and maybe this kinetal core complex is more rigid, and that's why they really form mm. a cylinder shape. And because we have the kinetal core complex in one side, the condensins of the SMC complex wonder could only be the other side, and in this other side we will have the loops of chromatin. And when we fill with loops of chromatin, we have this kind of groove that we observe in, the, in, in, holo, in some holocentric species. So these are, uh, yeah, electronic, electronic microscopy when you see this kind of groove uh, around the centromer. So I think that the models that I show with just compaction will be one stage of compaction. And at least for holocentric species, maybe this helps forming the line, bringing the centromer cones together, and then the complex of the, the kinetal core complex then could really form and shape into a, a rigid structure be pulled. Thank you. So, beautiful talk, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you if uh, you considered uh, uh, introducing uh, the sister uh, cousin chromatic cohesion also? Uh, no. Uh, you, you think <laughs> it's, uh, it's not important? Oh, would it change sure. something? For would sure. it change something? To, to consider uh, like a second chromosome being compacted there. Well, I have a simulation, I don't have it here, but I, I simulated two chromatin fibers randomly and then just do loop extrusion between them. And it was really nice to see that they, they separate by themselves. So the question is how to hold them together during the process. Well, they are all held together. That's, uh, yeah. Yes, you could put that, but will this change something in the mechanical properties of your chromatin? I don't know. I think this actually helps us understand better how this cohesion works between them, because it must be something that doesn't affect. Mm -hmm. So they, they, comp they can compact and be held together maybe by a ring that allows sort of fibers to cross and uh, but I haven't simulated it for sure. It's one thing that I would like to do. Is the idea that centromeric units are anchors just for the halocentric ones, or that's uh, something you're guessing for everything else? But it doesn't appear to be true for everything else, right? Um, well, you mean for monocentric species, right? Too? Yes. Yeah, I also have some models where I put a holocent um, Central American units in just a small region and use this anchor system again. And the thing is that we don't know how Central Americans are organized. So it could be that they, it also happens in, in, in homocentric species. But one thing I, I think it's well, interesting... You know in some homocentric species you have some anchors that are not necessarily Central Americans, right? Yes, yes, especially during interface, but perhaps they do not follow this until metaphase, or perhaps they are hidden there like that because it's all more compacted. I don't know. But one thing I, I like with these different models is that they, the, the central mark units in one case is denser in interface and in one case it's not. We don't know why, but for sure so it tells us that they behave differently in different species. Hi, Amara, thank you. Uh, this model does a follow-up of Peter and Vittorio and Jose questions in a sense. First, have you tried to use different uh, SMC complex, I mean, uh, uh, modeling condensing two, and then at some point adding condensed one, and then maybe the cohesive cohesive that keep the sister together, the, 
do you, do you have plans for doing this or if you did something? E yes. Well, for cohesion, I said I would like to, but I think they, it works in a different way. We don't know if it's really extruding a loop between the sister chromatids or just holding it together. So this would be different. But I actually started considering condensing one and two, putting different lifetimes so they make different size of loops. And it's, it's funny, but I, I end up using just one condensing model because it would be easier to present. <laughs> So it's easier to explain the mechanism that it's the loop extrusion. And, and because in the, when we consider both, we can really see two steps of condensation when there's only one condensing and comes the other. So I, yes, I consider, I think, putting both condensings uh, would be similar. OK, so let's thank Amanda again and um, move for the next. <laughs> So our next speaker is going to be Mariana Ferreira. Mariana. So next speaker is going to be Mariana Ferreira um, from the Instituto de Biophysica Medi Bioquímica Médica. Biophysica Carlos Chagas Filho. Ah, Biophysica Carlos Chagas Filho, UFRJ. Hi, um, good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizers for allowing us to share our work here in this space. And I'm um, doing a PhD at uh, UFRJ, and the work I'm going to present is the evaluation of quantum descriptors on molecular dynamic simulations of Viva Pain 2, a sustained protasis from Plasmodium Vivex. Uh, so, uh, starting about talking about the infectious disease, malaria is uh, an infectious disease caused by Plasmodium. Uh, the genus Plasmodium, and they are transmitted by a female vector of mosquito, Anopheles. And here in Brazil, the highest uh, number of cases, oh, sorry, is caused by Plasmodium vivax. Uh, and it, during the parasite cycle in humans, it has two phases. They hepatic one and the erythrocytic one. And in the erythrocytic one, we have the hemoglobin hydrolysis that is done by papain-like sustained proteases such as Vevapain 2. And here we can see the, in the figure papain and falsipain as well uh, uh, in evidence and the catalytic site. Uh, talking about uh, lustery is a process where the perturbation outside the active site of a protein uh, affects the function. And it's very interesting in drug design to develop allosteric inhibitors because there are less conservation among species. So we can find inhibitors that are more specific to the species that we want to inhibit. And there are lower sh chances of siding effects during the treatment of patients. Uh, our group has been studying it in infected agents such as cruzane in uh, Tripanosoma cruzi. And talking about papain-like proteases, we've been studying the mechanic perturbation of it. So we in which we have the catalytic site and the allosteric site connected by motions. And we can find the catalytic sites open and the allosteric uh, closed and vice versa. But we would like to go further and think about the electronic perturbation that we can find uh, and we can cause uh, by binding a ligand in an allosteric site. And here in this paper, Fukushima uh, finds that the frontier orbitals of a molecular, it, they are found at the catalytic site. And we would like to study that in this work. Uh, 
the frontier orbitals of macromolecule, they are directly involved in the reaction. So we can find an electron that is uh, th that left the, the enzyme and goes to the substrate, for example. And the idea is to find a ligand that which the energy gap between the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital uh, and the highest occupied molecular orbital is shorter than the substrate. And that's hap uh, that we are studying this strategy because the papain-like cysteine proteases, they have this electron here on the sulfur that hydrolyzes the, the bound. And the main goal of my work is to evaluate the reactivity throughout the trajectories of molecular dynamics simulations in the most prevalent conformations of vivapain 2 and their relationship between the catalytic and allosteric cavities. Uh, the methodology, so we got the 3D module of vivapain 2 and we protonated at pH 5.5 because these enzymes, they are located in the, the digestive vacuole of the parasite. Uh, we've done all atom simulations in replicates, and from them we obtained conformational clusters. Those conformational clusters were submitted to Cavity Plus uh, server, where we identified the cavities and their allosteric potential. Uh, moreover, we used these conformations uh, in MOPAC to calculate the electronic density with semi-empirical calculations. And this electronic density was assessed by Primordia, a program that analyzes the descri quantum descriptors. And we found Foucault's index, the reactivity potential on the molecule, and that's what we are going to use. Uh, so first of all, the allosteric site on protein surface. We've he here we have the different conformations that were the most representative ones. And uh, we can see that in a structure-based drug design, it is interesting to look for different conformations instead of only one that uh, sometimes is it, what happens. Uh, and here I like to uh, show the cavity one and cavity two that I'm going to talk about later. Uh, the molecular orbitals of vivapain two. Uh, here we have a chart of the density of the states. Uh, we have the most reactive orbitals and the uh, the orbitals that are not involved in uh, reaction. Uh, we can see that. The, in a band of three electron volts uh, from the LUMO and from OMO, we have them, they are located at the catalytic sites of the enzyme, and that's very interesting. So we, uh, so we found that the most reactive orbitals are indeed located here and in this band of energy. Um, so the cavity one that I showed earlier, uh, it's ne is located next to the catalytic site, and we have access to the catalytic cysteine. And it's interesting because we can think about uh, docking a ligand uh, or developing a drug that can access this, uh, this atom and inhibit the, the catalysis. Uh, the other uh, catalytic uh, allosteric cavity that I showed was the cavity two. Oh, sorry, the cavity two that is located in a, it's in blue on the right, and uh, we saw that different the different conformations, the clusters that we uh, obtained, they present different reaction. Uh, on the catalytic residues. So we have estrogen and cysteine here, and the structure on the left has the highest uh, levels of reactivity, and uh, the structure on the right has the lowest ones. And it's interesting because it's when it has the cavity two that 
the structure. Uh, the residues present the lowest reactivity. Uh, and we thought, okay, how it will look like uh, during a trajectory? And we decided to access the trajectory, uh, my one equi equivalent to one microsecond, um, the reactivity of the, ca the residues involved in the catalysis. So we have cysteine, histidine, and asparagine. And it's interesting because we can see there is a peak of reactivity um, at some point during 700 nanoseconds. And uh, we think that the confirmation in which the catalytic residues are more reactive should be the confirmation that it's going to be used in a docking in a, a later analysis. Uh, concluding, uh, we found five representative structures throughout the dynamics, and the allosteric was predicted for some cavities identified on the surface of the proteins. The reactivity of vivapain 2 depended on the conformation obtained, and it, vary, and it was varying throughout the trajectory. And with that, we obtained three possible strategies to go further on. Uh, first one is to use the most reactive conformation to develop a covalent ligand at an active site. Uh, the second one is to use the lowest reactivity conformation, but it has the allosteric site uh, to develop a non-covalent inhibitor. And also to use the conformation with the axis next to the catalytic site to develop uh, an allosteric covalent inhibitor. And Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariana. So questions? Hi, Mariana. Really, really nice. Okay. Um, I, I love everything that has cysteines in it. <laughs> cysteines are really amazing. Uh -huh. um, from your reactivity index, what you are actually capturing is what's happening once the ligand comes in and it, it needs a reaction to take place. But you know, all of these cysteine reactions, they need deprotonation first. Yes, so yes. a cysteine is always protected as long as it has a proton, the proton reduces reactivity. Yes, yes. Did, did you ever look at it? Maybe some of these conformations will have a higher PK, others have a lower PK. Did you so look? Maybe some of these conformations from your di dynamics uh -huh have a high cysteine PKA value, ah, okay. others have a low. Did you ever calculate okay. that? Uh, we've calculated on um, the beginning before doing the trajectories. So that's, we haven't done that later, after. Yeah, that would be a good suggestion for you to do, just to see the variation. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Look at it as an energy, not as a PKA, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Another question, Mariana? Well, if not, let's thank you, Mariana, again. So let's move to our next speaker, who is going to be Marcelo Poleto. Marcelo. So it's Marcelo from the engineering school uh, in Lorena, University of Sao Paulo. Marcelo. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? That's cool. Um, first of all, thank you, the organizers, for having me. Um, I will be sharing a topic that is very close to my heart. And I apologize if someone has seen a pieces of this bit last Thursday. But I will try to make it very <laughs> interesting uh, again. Um, well, this one. OK. So um, I can almost guarantee that everyone has seen a picture like this, or either in real life or news, this endless sea of 
plastic waste filling a lot of our landfills, which is really nasty because they degrade down to those micro and nano sized particles that do not only disrupt several um, ecosystems, but they also accumulate up to the food chain. And they tend to reach us, the top of the food chain, which is a problem because they will accumulate in human tissues, like gut, like heart, like brain, like placenta, like testicles. So yeah, it's not a good news for us, and we cannot get rid of it. If you look around, everything's made of plastics nowadays, and all of them will get to the landfills eventually. They will be wasted. We do not know how to deal with them, and we need to get something done about this. So thankfully, nature has been trying to do the same. Uh, and most of we have seen several microorganisms that degrade PET, which is always cool because we could use those enzymes, PETase and metase, which are basically the main ones that uh, degrade PET, as a biotechnological solution, which would be great, um, although we have industrial um, level challenges to deal with. So the idea would be if we can degrade down the polymer down to their molecular building blocks, ethylene glycol and TPA, in a very efficient manner, and in efficient, I'm saying either cost and um, recycling those, uh, capturing those again, we could fill this gap and make a circular economy concept around PET, basically making revenue out of waste which is a race. Every country has been trying to do this and find that, that kind of a solution. Biotechnological solutions might be one of the answers. So the problem with the industrial applications nowadays is that cost, basically. We know the technology to do it, but we need to deal with cost. The cost problem comes here at the pre-treatment uh, pre of the feedstock, which is basically inducing the glass transition because those enzymes do not work well in crystalline PET, and we need to make this crystalline pet to the amorphous phase so those enzymes can work. And that requires energy, which means power. And that comes with cost. The second problem is um, we need to add caustic agents to um, neutralize the bioreactor. And that's a cost, uh, that's a driving of the cost as well. So I'm going to focus on the crystallization part of it, because that's one of the things that are, is still driving the cost um, and hampering that technology. So for that, we understand that we need to understand better the interface between PET and enzymes, how that works, mostly at the electrostatic level, because if we are talking about rea rea reactions, we need that understanding better. So we develop a Drude polarizable force field, which goes a little bit in the other direction than simplification of coarse grain. We go to the direction of more accurate force fields. And in the Drude force field, we have those auxiliary particles within the parent atom, and the displacement of that um, Drude particles is something that we use to model the change in the electric field around those, those um, molecules. This is an extension of a greater Drude force field. We have proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, water, ions, name it. We, we are developing a lot. Um, so the first thing that we did is to characterize the crystal phase, which means we model like a patch of crystal unit, ran it in water, and what we see is those different layers in water, they have a increased dipole moment, average dipole moment on each of those pet residues. That does not happen in a non-polarizable force field as it should, because they are non-polarizable. But we see that as a function of the solvent, which is something that other force fields would not be showing us, which means that in terms of the electrostatic potential, oh, this not, does not look good. Sorry. It should be much more blue here. But trust me, they are very different in terms of vacuum and water. Um, the electrostatic potential increases because water is a polarizing agent, will polarize the surface of PET. Why that's important? Because once we bind stuff like a CBM or things that usually, um, proteins that usually bind to sur crystal surface that enhance catalytic activity, we see a modulation of that 
electrostatic potential in a, like two or three volts, which is a lot because that will induce a lot of difference in binding energy. And for this case here, one of the C-bands that we calculated, very crude, gets to 20 k cal per mole in interaction energy, which is quite a lot. So all of those, that energy coming from uh, induced electronic polarization is something that we are seeing now with this force field, which we think would help us designing better binders for PET. <sighs> Well, in the amorphous phase, we did this huge thing. This amorphous material, we get a very um, dead-on structural properties. But when we also evaluate the dipole moment um, response as a function of the, this Z layer, which is basically the exposition to the solvent, while in vacuum we have a depolarization response, um, in water we have a polarization response, as we were talking about the crystal, but it gets an average value of 1 dBi, which is cumulative, cumulatively a lot in the whole surface, but they also get up to like 3 dBi, two, 2 dBi 3, which is quite a lot of polarization response in a very big area that will cause changes in binding energy as well. Um, and I do have time, so I will get to the second part of this idea that Mod that is modeling the interface between PET and proteins. We see that PET responds a lot to the environment, and that response will also happen inside a enzyme, because enzymes do that. They modulate the electronic properties of your substrate, modeling um, electronic density to cause a reaction. So the idea of those PET hydrolases, either PETase or methase, is that they are serine hydrolases. So they this, uh, this hydroxyl will act as a nucleophile, uh, attacking this carbonyl bond here. The C4 will be our electrophile. That bond here will be broken, causing an intermediate um, state here. So keep that in mind. That would be interesting. So what we want to understand is how the modulation of the enzyme occurs in terms of the substrate. So that enzyme is actually stabilizing the transition state. That's why the reaction barrier will get lower, because in this case, the intermediate state, this guy, is this guy. The, and the double bond is broken here. Um, and the enzyme is trying to um, stabilize this transition state by exerting an electric field, which is the idea uh, that has been studied by the Boxer group in Stanford, that the, an electric field that modulates a electronic density and helps stabilizing the transition state will also help to break some of those bonds and facilitate catalysis. So what we are measuring here with an algorithm that we developed to calculate in the molecular mechanics level, we can see actually that both PETAs and METAs are exerting an electric field that is very directional in this carbon new bond once we have this electric field uh, direction that points this way, electronic negative charges as electrons will move the other way, will cause the appearance of this intermediate, uh, intermediate state here. Um, both PETAs and METAs, they exert a very directional electric field uh, at this bond right here. And the, what we are trying to gain from this is it's not only directional, it's a quantitative measurement that we can use now to evaluate mutants. How other mutants, different enzymes, might be able to modulate that electric field in terms of direction, in terms of magnitude, and can we use that to actually design better enzymes? Because in the MM, the molecular mechanics level, that's quite hard because we're not dealing with breaking and making of new bonds. So we believe that we can do this by using this as a metric. So the main takeaway of this talk is, yay, not our model works, which is always nice to hear. Um, the electronic properties of the PET polymer is something that we cannot neglect if we are talking about designing better binders or better enzymes, because they do respond quite a lot to the environment. Um, those, both of those enzymes, PETase and METase, 
they modulate the binding, the, the substrate in different manners because they do have the same um, chemistry, but the architecture of the binding site is a little bit different. And we want to study that as well. And the idea of bi guiding engineering efforts using the electric field is something that excites us because it's a quantitative measurement that we can take from our MM evaluations. And that will be all. Thank you. Marcel, so questions? Huh. I've been following on our working bacteria, a lot of people trying to redesign bacteria for whatever ecological or cleaning purpose. Mm -hmm. The problem is when you change the bacteria to do something, then they cannot survive on their natural environment. How, how do you deal with that problem? Well, so one of the things that we're trying to do, instead of using bacteria, them, all the entire bacteria, they can express the enzymes and use them in the, directly in the bioreactor. Another people that are trying to use fungi, fungi instead of bacteria because they tend to form biofilms a little bit better than bacteria. So this is a question of the, in the bioreactor realm. How do we do that? How we deal with that? And that would be a separation of separation of pathways, basically. Because once we are dealing with bioremediation, then we have to deal with how the bacteria survives, because it is a treatment thi thing. But once we have to deal with uh, waste, then not necessarily, we don't necessarily need bacteria there, because we need to recover ethylene glycol and TPA in a very, in the most um, pure form. So, because we need them later, and we keep need to keep in a very pure form to make the mechanical properties of the new pet as well. Okay. So there are different pathways in terms of how to treat waste, either the bioreaction. So on that, on, on that case, they don't have competition. They can live calmly there and just do their job? On the second case? On the second on case? When I'm treating waste? Yes. Well, in those cases, cleaning up your waste with a whole bacteria and everything inside is much more complicated than just getting rid of proteins, express, expression, uh, heterologous expression proteins. So I think this is how they are trying to do so far, using um, homologous proteins in the bioreactor instead of um, um, entire bacteria. Do you have another question? Check. Um, do they, have people looked at uh, uh, the evolution of the petase enzyme. Um, do they know which enzyme, which naturally occurring enzyme was co-opted to, to degrade plastics? So basically, the, those enzymes, they, are, they were classified before, like in about 10 years ago, they were classified as acerases and cutnases. Um, and then because we started to find a lot of microorganisms with specificity, because those microorganisms, they actually use PET as a carbon source, they decided to do a different um, CASI entry as PETase. But they are originally making the same chemistry as esterases, for instance. So some esterases, they have more um, specific activity for PET, but they also degrade other esters as well, necessarily poly ring esters. Thanks, Marcel, for the nice talk. Uh, so how, like, like now, now do you understand a lot about this uh, interaction between the PET and the enzyme? Do you know how sticky the PET is to other proteins, like how it binds to everything? Because you're saying that it's we found everywhere in our body. So how toxic that is, basically. Oh, yeah, that's nasty. So in the, uh, can I show you? Right here. So the, sorry. while. We are, I'm sh just showing you one monomer here in the PETase. The polymer, it's much longer, and they will wrap around. We are talking about like two, three binding site re regions for the PETase. We do not know how PET monomers or nano-sized particles will interact with anything in our body. Membranes, do they cross? Do they disrupt membranes? How do they get over? We do not know that, or how those molecules, tiny molecules, will disrupt other cascades, or will interfere with other metabolic pathways. 
none of that is known. We just know so far, we are at the tissue level evaluation, we see a lot of inflammation, but we haven't done like molecular level what is doing down there. It's scary, I know. <laughs> so any other question? So if not, thank you, Marcelo, again. <laughs> Okay, so next speaker is uh, Chuck Farah from the Institute of Chemistry of the University of Sao Paulo. Chuck. Hello, thank you for the invitation to come here. It's a beautiful venue. I uh, didn't know this place before. It's uh, very, I will have to talk to Victor about how you can rent this place for future, future events. So um, I, I, I heard that uh, Roberto had talked about the, the general topic that I'm going to talk about today. So I think he made it, he gave an introduction. We, we're studying uh, uh, the, a mechanism by which bacteria compete with each other. Um, and the particular mechanism is uh, mediated by a, what we call a type four secretion system. So what's a secretion system in bacteria? Bacteria have evolved many um, uh, molecular machines to secrete back t uh, uh, proteins from inside the cell to outside and sometimes um, simultaneously injecting the protein into a target cell. And this target cell can be a eukaryotic cell, a host cell, a plant cell, an animal cell, or it can be uh, another bacteria, for example. So we've studied in the past, in the, 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 the bacteria that we study is Xanthomonas citri, which is a bacteria that infects uh, citrus plants, and it has its genome codes for several of these different type, types of secretion systems. So the type 3 secretion system is responsible for um, injecting virulence factors into uh, 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 citrus cells the, of the plant in the, in the leaves and in the, in the, in the fruits where the, where the bacteria um, colonize, um, and these uh, virulence factors will change the genetic, um, the gene expression in the, in the host cell um, and facilitate the growth of the bacteria. Uh, we've also studied a, a, a type 4 pilus, which is important for um, locomotion and biofilm formation by the bacteria. And we've also studied a type 6 secretion system, which protects the bacteria against um, uh, amoeba that feed on the bacteria. But I'm going to talk about another type uh, secretion system, this type 4 secretion system, which, like I, which, which is part of a family um, that is very well distributed among bacteria. And it's, it's mostly known for mediating bacterial conjugation. So bacteria can exchange genetic material, often um, pieces of DNA that they capture from the outside, or plasmids, which are cir uh, circles of DNA. And this conjugation is mediated by these type 4 secretion systems. And the prototypical type 4 secretion system um, has been studied um, quite a lot by many groups um, and uh, a very spectacular example of a structural biology um, approach to understanding how these systems um, work uh, has uh, came out of the laboratory of Gabriel Waxman in Birkbeck College over several decades of work but it sort of culminated in a paper 
a paper that came out a couple of years ago where they studied this. Uh, they, they finally got a, a molecular model of a full length type 4 secretion system. So here, um, just let's look at the anatomy of it. These are found in gram-negative bacteria. Gram-negative bacteria have two membranes. So when they secrete a protein from the inside to the outside of the cell, it has to cross these two membranes. Um, so there's a, there's a part of the secretion system that's embedded in the outer membrane, which is called the core complex, which is made up of, of three proteins called VIR, B, 7, 9, and 10. And it's all, it also has an inner membrane complex that's made up of several different proteins and many copies. I'm not going to go through them all here. Um, but at the base, there is a, there is a, a, a protein that uh, appears in 12 copies uh, that makes two concentric rings. It's called VIR B4. And attaching this inner membrane complex and this outer membrane complex is this sort of central um, uh, tower or stalk um, made up of VIR B5 and VIR B6. So we're trying to understand how, so there's a lot of interest in trying to understand how these type 4 secretion systems work. So in this case, uh, this type 4 secretion system is involved in conjugation. So it uh, captures DNA, uh, usually a plasmid DNA, on the inside of the cell, processes it, and then the DNA is extruded through the system in some way that is not known, um, attached, covalently attached to a protein, and injected into a, another bacterial cell. In the case of Xantomonas, in the case of Xantomonas, however, it has a type 4 secretion system uh, that's not involved in conjugation, but it's involved in competition between bacteria. So it uh, is involved in, uh, uh, it secretes toxins from one bacteria to another. Instead of transferring a piece of DNA from one bacteria to another, it's transferring a toxin. So we're interested in understanding how it, what are the toxins, um, how these toxins are selected for, for uh, transfer. Um, and so I'm going to just give you a little uh, 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 idea of some of the work that we've been doing over the last several years in this, in this respect. So I think that uh, uh, Roberto may have shown you some of these slides here, but here this is just basically showing that uh, if you mix Xantomotis citri, which is here colored in, in cyan, with E. coli, which is colored in, in uh, yellow, if you mix the two together and grow them on a petri dish, the Xantomotis citri cells will outcompete the, uh, the E. coli cells, even though Xantomotis citri is relatively slow-growing bacteria compared to E. coli. But if you knock out the type 4 secretion system, then the E. coli will outcompete the Xantomotis. So this type 4 secretion system seems to be involved in competition. And <coughs> I think Roberto showed you this, this movie before, uh, which basically shows the Xantomotis cells killing E. coli cells. So I think Roberto showed you this movie yesterday, so I'm going to skip it, save some time. Okay, you showed this movie, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but, and, this, and this system is not only found in Xantomonas, but it's also found in related bacteria. For example, Stenotrophomonas maltophila, which is a bacteria that's found in the soil, but is also, also uh, found in hospital um, infections in people with immune deficiencies. Um, if you see here, the Stenotrophomonas in uh, uncolored comp competing with E. coli. And if you watch, the, oh, if you watch that movie again, uh, you could see at the, where, the, where the Stenotrophomonas and the E. coli are in contact, you'll see the E. coli cells dying. So I'm going to uh, show you a few uh, results of some structural studies that we've been doing on this system. Um, and this has been done over the last several years in collaboration with Roberto uh, with, and some ex-students of mine, George Souza, Herman Sodro, and G Gabrielle Aka. 
So uh, one, one study that we've been uh, uh, um, trying to develop is trying to under understand the, the overall structure of the system. And like I mentioned before, the system can be divided into two, two main components, the inner membrane complex and the outer membrane complex that's connected by the stock. So the outer membrane complex is, is made up of uh, three proteins, VIRB7, VIRB9, and VIRB10. So Hermann Sogro, he expressed a, a segment of the chromosome of Xanthomonas citri in E. coli that expresses uh, B7, B8, B9, and B10. Um, in E. coli and was able to purify a complex containing these three proteins, B7, B9, and B10. And we underwent a cryo-electron microscopy project um, where we could uh, plunge freeze these complexes on electron microscope grids and uh, collect images as, as are shown here. And these uh, these images of each of the particles can be classified in what we call 2D classes. And these 2D classes are basically projections of 3D objects. And they can be, these 2D, these 2D classes can be used to construct a three-dimensional volume, um, which is shown here. And you can, uh, if you have enough particles at a high enough resolution, talking about hundreds of thousands of particles, uh, you can create an electron, uh, electron microscopy map that has resolution enough to be able to, uh, to determine the positions of, of amino acid side chains. So here we can see, you can see the, the resolution in this, in this uh, complex that has 14 copies of each of the three proteins. And this is what we call a, a resolution map. So you can see that there are different areas where the resolution is, is, is different. Uh, the resolution at the, at the bottom and at the top is around, around four angstroms or five angstroms, whereas in the center, the resolution is, is relatively, is, is much better. Uh, so th like I said, this, is a, this outer membrane complex in Xanthomonas is made up of 14 copies of three of the proteins. Uh, VIRB7, which is shown here in cyan, which has this uh, amino terminal tail and then this C terminal globular domain. And it's interacting with the C terminal domain of VIRB9. VIRB9 also has an N terminal domain. And we also see this in yellow, the VIRB10 C terminal domain. The amino terminal domain of VIRB10, which has around almost 200 amino acids, 180 amino acids, is not, is not seen in this map. Okay, um, so the VIRB10 uh, subunits make this inner lumen and uh, it makes a, a ring made up of 14 helical hairpins that go through the outer membrane. And the VIRB9 uh, subunit, yeah, the C terminus, interacts with this globular domain of VIRB10 on the outside and extends the. Uh, this cylinder downward, and the VIRB7, the monomers, it's a lipoprotein, in fact, so there's a cysteine here at the amino terminus that's covalently bond, bound to a phospholipid that's inserted into the, into the inner leaf of the outer membrane, and these VIRB7 uh, monomers interact with each other and with VIRB9 on the, on the periphery of the, of the outer membrane complex. We were also, the interesting, I mentioned that the VIRB10 amino terminus, which has around 180 amino acids, it is invisible in the, uh, in the, uh, electron, uh, map, in the electron microscopy map. Um, but we did have a small density found at the, uh, at the base of this uh, toroid here that looked like a piece of a helix that could not be accounted for with the VIRB, with VIRB9. And it was basically uh, inserting in between two VIRB9 amino terminal subunits. And Hoberto, Hoberto at the same time was studying this VIRB10 amino terminus by NMR and studying its interaction with the VIRB9 amino terminus. Um, and he was seeing that 
uh, around 10 or 12 amino acids uh, in the VIRB10 uh, NMR spectrum were perturbed when we added VIRB9. And, these, and he could map these uh, residues to this stretch here between amino acids 150 and 160. And when we looked at the sequence of these amino acids, we could actually model it into the electron density map uh, of, of, of our complex here. So this is a small stretch of VIRB10 that is it, from the amino terminus that could be found in, uh, associated with VIRB9 here. So here we could now use the, uh, the model from the Gabriel Waxman group to substitute this outer membrane complex with the outer membrane complex from Xanthomonas citri here to make this sort of a composite model of, uh, uh, for our, um, for our uh, type 4 secretion system looking at the outer membrane complex. But now I'm going to switch to another question uh, regarding how, how the, um, in our case, how the, uh, the inner membrane complex selects substrates, selects the toxins that are going to be secreted by the system and injected into the target cell. So this, this, this cartoon here shows um, that we have uh, in, Xanthomonas, in Xanthomonas and other species that have this kind of type 4 secretion system, there's, they also uh, can, their genomes code for toxins that have basically two parts. They have an amino terminal region that has a toxic domain that can be targeting different um, uh, cellular structures in the target cell. And it also has a C terminal domain here found, shown in, in gray. It's called an XVIPCD domain. And it is, uh, it is required for um, recognition by a protein that's not found in this, in the, in this model here, which is called VIRD4, which is called a, a coupling protein. It's an ATPase, and it is responsible in all of these type 4 secretion systems for selecting what is going to be secreted. So we tr we're trying to understand how this, how this occurs. So here, this is just basically from an old study of ours, actually our first paper, where we showed that the VIRD4 protein interacts with a, with a group of proteins that are coded in the Xanthomonas citri genome, all of them that have this C-terminal XVIPCD domain. Okay? So this VIRD protein will interact with all of these proteins here, even though they have different domains, different architectures in their amino termini, but they all have this about 120 amino acid C-terminal region uh, that is relatively conserved here. You can see it can be divided into two parts, uh, an amino terminal part where there are some conserved motifs and a C-terminal part that's much less complex in its, in its sequence, uh, has a sort of a acidic and glutamine rich region here. And then at the C-term, at the, at the uh, extreme C terminus has uh, positively charged and hydrophobic region. Okay, so um, these these toxins have been were characterized by several people in my laboratory uh, to show that they can be uh, they can uh, degrade peptidoglycan, they can de degrade, phos degrade degrade phospholipids, um, and these toxins also. Oops. These toxins also are, are co-expressed, each of these toxins in the genome are co-expressed by a protein, by a, with a uh, gene that codes for an antitoxin or an immunity protein. And we've been able to determine the structures of some of, some of these immunity proteins that interact with the catalytic domains of their cognate uh, toxins. Okay, but let's look at these, uh, these XVIPCD domains. So these XVIPCD domains, they interact with this VIRD4 protein. And in co collaboration with Hoberto, uh, 
uh, we were able to determine the NMR structure of this XVIPC domain for one of these toxins. But here, um, and you can see the, the, the level of, of conservation, of amino acid conservation. Most of the highly conserved amino acids in this globular domain, which is this amino terminal part, um, are located on, this, on the face of this three-stranded beta sheet here. And I'm, uh, here I'm highlighting some amino acids, especially this phenylalanine, this valine, and this other valine here um, that make this sort of hydrophobic patch here. Okay? Um, and this, the, the, this, the sequences, these proteins, you can find several thousand of these proteins in the, in the, in the uh, protein databanks. And when we mix this XVIPCD domain with a, fra with a part of the VIRD4 protein, which is called the all-alpha domain, which is the, 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 the this, this protein, this VIRD4 protein, has a ATPase domain, and it has a central domain that's found at the bottom of this hexamer um, that uh, uh, interacts with the substrate. So when we add this to the XVIPCD domain in the NMR tube, we can see several... Uh, residues uh, changing positions and changing intensities. They're, they're, uh, there's, their signals in the NMR spectrum uh, change significantly. We can map this to, a, to, to, the, to, the, to the XVIPCD domain. And it, most of the most perturbed uh, uh, residues correspond to this, um, this uh, beta sheet, um, and especially these hydrophobic uh, uh, residues at the center of the beta sheet, and also some um, hydrophilic residues in these loops here. So now, so how does this XVIPCD domain interact with VIRD4? So here is an is a alpha fold model of the VIRD4 protein the hexameric form of this VIRD4 protein. So it's assumed to be a hexamer because there are just a few structures of homologs in the databases and, uh, and some of them crystallize as hexamers, okay? Uh, and they have, a, they have an amino terminal uh, pair of helices that are embedded into the inner membrane and it has this globular domain here. Um, and here is one of the one of the subunits is shown in yellow, and the all-alpha domain here is shown in, in, uh, in brown. Uh, so, an interesting observation is that in Xanthomonas, if you look at Xanthomonas citri, this all-alpha domain, a part of this all-alpha domain, and other related Xanthomonadacea species, uh, and compare it with the all-alpha domains from the VIRD4 proteins from other systems that are involved in transferring plasmids or f transferring DNA into plant cells, you can see that there's a significantly enlarged, uh, there's an insertion here or a deletion in these that corresponds to this, this loop here in the alpha fold model for the VIRD4 from Xanthomonas citri. And, uh, and this, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm uh, pointing towards this because when we look at, when we look at the NMR spectrum, again, in collaboration with Roberto, the NMR spectrum of this all alpha domain, and uh, he was able to, uh, Roberto and uh, his student and my ex-student, uh, Gabrielle, were able to assign around 70% of the residues, and when we mix that in, mix that with the XVIPCD domain, um, we could map certain residues that were perturbed um, by the addition of the XVIPCD domain, and you can see that most of them are uh, are concentrated on one face of this domain, including this extended extended alpha helix. Um, that uh, is a little different in the Xanthomonas uh, type 4 secretion systems. 
And when we do an alpha fold model for the complex, we actually see that the alpha fold will put this, will, uh, uh, the interface between these two domains uh, involves this conserved surface of the uh, XVIPCD domain and this uh, extended loop here on the uh, all alpha domain. So, um, and you can see that this, this XVIPCD domain in, in all of these toxins seems to be, it's, it's shown here, it's, it's separate from the other domains. The, the, this is a peptidoglycan binding domain in the case of this toxin. And this is a, uh, a, a glycohydrolase domain in the amino term, and it's here. Um, so we can make a, we can uh, incorporate this interaction into the model of the VRD4 hexamer. And we can see this interface occurring at the base of this hexamer. And we can do this, we can make homology models of the XVIPCD domains from all the other toxins that are coded by the type 4, by, by the Xanthomonas citri genome. And they all, because they're homology models, they're all sort of positioned in the same in the same way with the all alpha domain here. And one interesting observation is that when we look at all of these um, XVIPCD domains associated with the all alpha domain, they have an extended C terminal helix whose C terminus points to the, the central channel at the bottom, the opening of the central channel at the bottom of this, of this hexamer here. So, so the, the interaction, this interaction between the, between the uh, XVIPCD domain and the all alpha domain may be used to position the C terminus, the extreme C terminus of this domain near the, uh, the opening of the uh, VRD4. Uh, hexamer channel here. And this VRD4 is an ATPase, and its ATPase activity is necessary for the successful secretion of proteins through this, this system. So, um, oops. Just wanted to show this is a work in progress here. Uh, Daniela. Uh, Daniela Sifuens from my laboratory and Luis Cesar from Roberto's laboratory have been able to crystallize a complex of the VRD4 and the uh, all-alpha domain and the XVIPCD domain of one of the toxins. Um, and we're awaiting time on the, on the uh, serious beam line in Campinas uh, to, to collect data on this. This should happen probably in the month of November when the when the beam line comes back into operation. So uh, my main points uh, that I covered were that this, uh, we have a type 4 secretion system that uh, secretes toxins into other bacteria, uh, that these toxins are recognized by way of an interaction between a C-terminal, a, 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 a conserved C-terminal domain and the all-alpha domain of the VRD4 coupling protein. Um, and these effectors all have different catalytic domains in their amino termini that attack different targets in the, in the, in the, in the target cell. And that this interaction may help to po poise the extreme C-terminus for insertion into the hex hexameric channel, okay? And we've shown, doing other studies, that the extreme C terminus is absolutely important for successful um, uh, transfer into the target cell. Okay, so these are other things, other questions that we were studying in the laboratory. Uh, this work has been done, like I mentioned, in uh, strong collaboration with Roberto's lab, involving several of my students. Uh, in the in the in the past and the present, also we've had collaboration with the Gabriel Waxman group to do the electron microscopy work. 
uh, and also with the electron microscopy group at the uh, LN Nano in Campinas as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chuck. So we have time for questions. I think everyone wants to go for coffee. <laughs> this sort of toxin attack, how many bacteria fall on that glass? Like you said, this screen. Yeah. Is that a mechanism? Is a particular class of bacteria yeah. that has this mechanism to protect themselves? It seems, it seems that this system is found in Xanthomonadacea bacterial order. So Xanthomonas, Stenotropomonas, Lysobacter, uh, Lutemonas, uh, Diella, and then there's, uh, so these are all sort of like soil bacteria or plant associated bacteria. And there's also, we've also found some examples in some species of Neisseria and Burkholderia, um, which are also environmental bacteria. Um, so it seems like they're, it's just, it's a system that they use to uh, compete with other bacteria for certain niches. There is another, there are other systems. But which bacteria can defend against it? We've, all, all of the, t all of the gram-negative bacteria that we've studied, Xanthomonas can kill. Or, let me put it another way. If you, if you, you can, you can show that it helps it defend itself against these other bacteria. Um, it looks like much more offensive than defensive. It, well, yeah, it is, it is offensive. It's definitely <laughs> offensive, but other bacteria will have other systems that are also attacking as well. So there's, there's type 6 secretion systems that do the same kind of thing through a different mechanism, and it seems to be more common. So it seems like in, in, the, bacterial, uh, in the bacterial world, because of horizontal DNA transfer, there are many toxin domains that are being transferred between bacteria and the bacteria can use them in for different ways so you can use you can use a bullet to be shot from a gun or from a cannon or from you know there it can if you add the certain recogn uh, uh, recognition domain it can be secreted through different machines, through different nanomachines. So many of these toxin domains that are secreted by this system, in other bacteria, they can be secreted by other systems. Okay, but they have other signaling domains, other recognition domains that, are, that, that these other nanomachines use to, to grab onto them and to secrete them. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? So if not, I think we can uh, okay. go for the coffee yeah, break, coffee. right? Yep. And then we can discuss in the coffee. Okay, let's thank Chuck again. Thank you.